Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to the generous underwriters of Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Wednesday, May 31st, we are studying Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 to 21. In today's text, the fifth and sixth angels blow their trumpets, and John witnesses demonic fury and destruction unleashed. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us returning guest, Pastor Caleb Adams. Pastor Adams serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Bend, Oregon. Pastor Adams, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Thanks for having me. It's good to be back. So we get started today, Pastor. Give us some Give us just your general approach to the book of Revelation. How should we approach it? Why is it a helpful book to Christians? Yeah, Revelation is, it's a, it's a challenging book. I would say it's the most challenging book in the scriptures. Um, and so it's important as we approach this to know what we're supposed to be looking for and how we're supposed to be understanding it. Um, you know, the, the title of the book gives us a really good hint as to what this is all supposed to be about and how we're supposed to to be reading it. Uh, it's the revelation, and it's specifically the revelation of Jesus Christ, which means that, that Jesus is the one revealing all of this crazy stuff <laughs> to John, his apostle. Um, but especially it means that this is the revealing of Jesus. It's, this is the, the unveiling of the glory of the exalted Lord Jesus Christ. And so um, as we read through the book, and, and especially as we tackle uh, one of the most interesting chapters today in chapter nine, where where there's not really a lot of Jesus to be seen as far as we can tell. Um, we should be attending to the fact that, that this book is, is about him and to be showing us his glory. Um, of course, it was written by John during his um, exile on the island of Patmos. Um, Church Father Irenaeus tells us that it was composed toward the end of the reign of the Roman Emperor Domitian, which is significant uh, because he's known as uh, one of those emperors who really started systematically in some ways persecuting uh, Christians, especially because of the clash between the emperor cults and, and the claim that Jesus Christ was Lord. Um, and so we see some of those things. We'll see those today. Um, of course, Revelation is apocalyptic literature. So if we want to read it like we would read other things, we're going to be very lost. Uh, I found this definition from the Lutheran Bible Companion, just a great little tool. Um, and thought I would just share that as, as we begin. Apocalyptic literature elaborated certain elements of aspects of Old Testament prophecy. It sought to interpret all history on the basis of purported visionary experiences of the author. It was especially interested in the end of history, that is eschatology, and the ushering in of the world to come. It utilized pictures, allegories, and symbols. Numbers, colors, and stars were in these images endowed with a profound significance. And in chapter nine today, we're, we're going to see all of those things. And so uh, as we read chapter nine, we might find ourselves uh, reacting the way that Luther did in his early encounters with Revelation. He's quoted as saying, my spirit cannot accommodate itself to this book. <laughs> and so uh, we might feel that way at times too. Uh, but Revelation is really a, it's a book of comfort, even though it's confusing and sometimes even terrifying. It's meant uh, to show us who wins. Uh, originally to comfort those suffering persecution in Asia Minor, and, and certainly all of us believers who who wait for the return of, of our glorious Jesus Christ, who's revealed here for us. Yeah, and that, that comfort might be a bit harder to see in chapter 9, but it is there. So as we look at chapter 9 today, what's the context? What should we know as we prepare to look at this chapter? Yeah, so we, we find ourselves today in the middle of uh, the blowing of the seven trumpets. So um, a helpful outline of the book of Revelation notes that there are three earthly cyclic views and two cosmic or heavenly views um, of events that are taking place from the time of the ascension of Christ all the way up to his return. And to try to view these chronologically or to locate certain things as specific points in human history, it's really tricky at best. These are really meant to narrate the same events 
over and over again from different perspectives, kind of adding different layers and, and things like that. So our text for today in chapter nine is right in the middle uh, of the second of these three earthly views, um, things that are happening on the earth between the time of Christ's ascension and return. And so in chapter eight, we have uh, the mention of the seven trumpets in verse two. And these seven trumpets, as they're blown, um, kind of bring about this decreation, the reversal of, of everything that God did in Genesis chapter one, uh, the, the stars and the, the sun and the moon and the creatures and plants, all of that are created in sequence. We kind of see the, the unraveling of that. Uh, so in the previous chapter, the first trumpet has hail and fire mixed with blood. The second trumpet is a mountain on fire burning, thrown into the sea. Uh, the third trumpet has a great star named Wormwood falling from heaven and um, poisoning the waters. The fourth trumpet, and we see that the, the sun and the moon and the stars are struck. Uh, so we can see that that creation is, is taking a beating here. And uh, the last verse of chapter 8 um, kind of wraps up the first four trumpets and leads us into what we're going to going to see in chapter nine. This eagle flies overhead and cries out with a loud voice, "Woe, woe, woe!" Three woes to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. And so, in in chapter nine, we we find ourselves hearing about the blowing of the fifth and the sixth trumpets, and we see that they're a a step up in intensity from the first four. There's something otherworldly that we're about to deal with um, in a, a much greater way even than the first four trumpets. So the seventh trumpet, by the way, doesn't come until chapter 11. So stay tuned for another episode of Sharper Iron to get to that. That's right. So we get trumpets five and six. Let's go ahead and, and read them. These are, are longer than the first four trumpets in terms of their description. And as you said, we're really starting to see how the... How the, the we're upping the ante here, as the, the eagle has prepared us to hear. So this is Revelation chapter 9. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them, and their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots, with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. The first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had, who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels, who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year, were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode on them. They wore breastplates the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. And the heads of the horses were like lion's heads, and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. The rest of mankind, who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, or their sorceries, or their sexual immorality, 
or their thefts. That's our text for today. That's Revelation 9, verses 1 to 21. Pastor Adams, before we look at specifics for these two trumpets being blown, uh, just thinking about this text in connection with the previous one and the, the six trumpets that we've heard so far, talk a little bit about the connection to the ten plagues in Egypt. We talked a little bit about that yesterday with chapter 8. How do we continue to see that here in chapter 9? Yeah, we're, we're going to see that continue on. Of course, the, the first few trumpets have some pretty obvious connections. The hail and the fire correspond with the seventh plague. The, the sea turning to blood reminds us of the Nile and the very first plague that that's sent upon Egypt. Uh, darkness covers the land in, in plague nine in Exodus chapter 10. And so as, as trumpets five and six up the ante, um, the underworld, as we just kind of heard, is invading the earth. And, and so we see that things get far worse than, than any of the Egyptian plagues, uh, though we're going to see that in trumpet five, we have locusts. There's a, a clear connection there. And trumpet six, even though um, perhaps there's not correspondence to a specific plague, we're going to see a lot of parallels between between the last one, the death of the firstborn, as, as a third of mankind are killed. And so we, we see God's judgment on those who stand against him. Yeah, and we mentioned this briefly yesterday. Uh, we said we'd see it more here in chapter nine, that the fact that the those who are sealed on their foreheads are protected— and the general reaction that's recorded at the end, both of those seem to connect as well to what happens there in the Exodus narrative. Yeah, absolutely. You have, you know, the Israelites are immune to all these things that are coming upon the Egyptians, and these terrifying locusts come, and they are sent to those who have not been sealed um, by the Lamb. And then in the end, of course, God is doing all of this to lead people to repentance. So, of course, that's where we're headed, just as the plagues, of course, would lead Pharaoh to to see the error of his ways, um, but in a very similar way, we see the the hardness of heart and the lack of repentance on the part of of God's creation. All right. So as the fifth trumpet is blown, the first thing John sees is a star fallen from heaven to earth, and that fallen star then is given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit, and he's going to open that. So. Who might this star be? What does it mean that he's opening this bottomless pit? Yeah, that is that is the question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> you know, my kind of routine as I do Bible study or prepare for a sermon or whatever it might be as I'm looking at a text is as I take a look at it and um, just make my own notes, take a look at the original language and see you know what I can come up with. And then I typically will turn to commentaries and what others have preached or said about these texts. And it was interesting. I put together all of my notes and thought I had a pretty good handle on it and then went to all the commentaries. And <laughs> just about every question you can ask about this chapter, someone has a different opinion than someone else, than someone else does. Um, so there are a lot of theories about a lot of this. Um, there are some who would say that, that the identity of this fallen star um, really isn't that important. The point is that it's sent from God. And so he's the one in charge, which is course true god is orchestrating all of this uh, some identify it with the wormwood that's mentioned the star named wormwood in chapter eight um it's possibly the same as that uh, it could be a, a specific demon um it could be the same as the angel with the key to the abyss that's going to be mentioned later on in chapter 20 um but i think i i would side with those who would identify uh, this particular angel as satan uh, he appears in a lot of places in Revelation, this is kind of one of the main introductions. Um, and you know, he's going to be a, a dragon later on. He's going to exercise his power in the form of these beasts that come upon the earth. Um, but it, it certainly seems that this is uh, to be identified with Satan. Although uh, we see that that Satan uses all sorts of different events and and people and things throughout history. Um, the Geneva Bible suggests that this is the Pope. Um, Luther, somewhat surprisingly, doesn't suggest it's the Pope. Uh, he identifies this as the great heretic Arius who, who led people astray. But um, it certainly, if not Satan himself, is, is uh, Satan exercising his power, as we'll see at, at the behest of God throughout. Um, and then he has this authority to, to open up the shaft of the bottomless pit, uh, not inherently, it's an authority given by God. There's all these passives that we encounter throughout Revelation, and especially in chapter 9, which point us to God as the one acting in all of this. God is 
is the one orchestrating all things. Um, but he is given the the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. And the Greek word for bottomless pit there is abyssos, or as we often translate it also, the abyss. And this is a tricky word um, because it also has a lot of different reference throughout the scriptures. Um, in fact, it appears in the Septuagint in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, uh, when it says darkness was, was hovering over the face of the abyss. Um, so throughout the Old Testament, this seems to have a, a similarity to uh, the Greek Hades. Certainly the Hebrew Sheol is connected to this. Now, by the time of the New Testament, the abyss is typically the place of punishment where demonic spirits are held. We see that um, in some of Jesus's conversations with them um, in the Gospel of Luke in particular. In Revelation, um, the abyss seems to be pretty much exclusively referred to as, as the abode of the devil and, and his demons. Uh, we're going to see a beast later emerging from the abyss. Um, in chapter 20, Satan will be thrown into it and imprisoned. Um, and so right now, um, he has the power to to open it up, um, to perhaps bring people into it, certainly to unleash things out of it, as, as we see. Um, but uh, all of this, of course, is is under God's control. Yeah, and I think that's a, that is an important point to make. As you said, we've seen that elsewhere in the book of Revelation. We see it here in chapter 9, that none of this is outside of the Lord's control. He directs it, and he is directing things for the good of his people, as, as we see here. So likely we've got Satan being able to open this abyss, and he's going to bring out from this abyss, as, as John describes it, there's smoke that comes out, it's going to darken the sun and the air, and then from that smoke come the locusts who have power like scorpions. I mean, this is just a remarkable vision that we're talking about. <laughs> Pretty typical, right? <laughs> <laughs> give us some of the give us some of those details. What what is it that it seems Satan is bringing out here from this abyss? Yeah, you know, it was interesting reading this passage uh, living here in Central Oregon. Um, we're pretty much immune from tornadoes and hurricanes and things like that. We've always got the threat of volcanoes, but but what we deal with pretty regularly here throughout the summer months are wildfires. And at times, uh, the smoke just covers everything. You can hardly see down the street. You can't really go outside any more than you have to. Um, and so that's that's how John describes the smoke that comes out of this this pit. And then out of the smoke appear these these locusts. And, and so we're confused right away. Is Was what looked like smoke really the locusts? Or did the locusts come after the smoke or out of the smoke? Um, regardless, we have these locusts that, of course, also oftentimes can cover the, cover the sun and, and block out the light. Um, and so... These locusts, though, once we once we think we've wrapped our head around that, we soon see we have no idea um, <laughs> what John's talking about, because these locusts are are not typical locusts in really any way whatsoever. Um, we certainly have the connection to the the eighth plague on Egypt in Exodus ten. Um, you have to, of course, mention the prophet Joel as his prophecy really centers on on these locusts that God is going to send, which are you know a his judgment on on the people and certainly foreshadowing the last day, um, but these locusts come and and they're they're unlike any locusts we've ever seen before, whether in in Egypt or in the prophet Joel or wherever else. Uh, these locusts are given the ability to to inflict terrible pain on people. Usually, locusts will will eat trees and, and plants and grass and things like that, um, and instead, the target of these locusts are our people. Um, it reminded me as, as I was reading this of uh, second Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul's talking about this thorn that was given him in the flesh, a, a messenger of Satan to harass me. Um, these locusts definitely by their description seem to be demonic in nature. Uh, they seem to be messengers of Satan uh, who are coming upon the, the earth just in, in terrifying fashion. And they're described as as having these scorpion-like tails, uh, which is significant also. Scorpions don't really appear very much um, in the New Testament. In fact, they appear only twice outside of Revelation, um, both in the Gospel of Luke, where 
Jesus gives the 72 authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy, um, which is an indication that scorpions, um, much like serpents or snakes, remind us of Satan and his power. Um, Luke 11 is the other one where, you know, if your son asks you for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? Of course not. Um, But the people are given scorpions here. Um, They're they're coming upon them to to inflict pain. Um, But again, we see God completely in charge of all of this. The beginning of uh, verse five, for example, we see they were allowed to torment them. Um, All of this is by God's direction, which, which I suppose um, is both comforting and, and a little unsettling. Um, God's judgment tends to be like that. And so at God's direction, um, these, Agents of torment uh, come upon the earth. It's kind of like when God allows Satan to to mess with Job and and torment him and afflict him, but not to kill him. Yeah, uh, we have the the same thing here. Yeah, well, and I think the connection again to the to the Exodus is helpful. That that at a certain point, after Pharaoh has hardened his heart over and over again, the Lord basically says, "Okay, let's do it your way." Then, and He continues to. Yeah to send those plagues, I mean, that's what Pharaoh wants. Pharaoh wants the Lord to, to do his thing, so Pharaoh gets it. And that's the, that is the terrifying nature of it. There is that, that note of hope, though, and I, I think this is important to bring out, that these locusts are, are only given to harm those who don't have the seal of God on their foreheads, so that those who are the people of God are protected from this, again, demonic infestation. Yeah, the, the Israelites are are safe over in Goshen while, while all of this is going on, right? Um, back in chapter 7 is the well-known um, sealing of the 144,000, which of course is a number not to be taken literally. It's um, representing the, the fullness of all of God's people who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb in that, that beautiful passage later on in that chapter. So just as Israel was spared from the plagues, um, and especially from the the death of the firstborn by the blood of the lamb, here too by the blood of the lamb, God's people are are rescued and and kept safe, and and so just as as is always the case, God's judgment is terrifying, but it is it is of great comfort to His people. This is this is the ultimate good guy defeating the ultimate bad guy and and all of his forces, um, but in the meantime, He's He's using the bad guy um, as he always has throughout history, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Romans, uh, for his purposes. But as they, as they torment, as they afflict, as they, as they seem to wield power, um, God is, is putting that within limitations as well. Not only keeping his people safe from, from these locusts, um, but also setting a specific time to, um, they are they are limited to to whom they can torment. They're limited to what they can do, and and then uh, they're limited to a specific time period. Uh, in verse five, they were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And so they're given a specific time period, and they're they're not able to to bring death. Um, you know, it's interesting whenever you come across a number in the book of Revelation, you should ask, well, what does that really mean? And so uh, this is a tricky one um, because. Five doesn't really seem to to have a lot of significance elsewhere in the book. Um, a lot of commentators would suggest this is the lifespan of a locust, or this is the length of the time of year that locusts are active, about five months. Uh, but clearly, a you know a plague of locusts or a swarm of locusts would not hang around for more than a few days. Um, so certainly, this is a this is a significant period of time. Um, there's one commentator who says the number five is half of ten. Egypt was struck by 10 plagues. 10 indicates the complete number. So these five are the half. The other half is to follow, and it does in the second woe. That's, that's clever, and maybe that's, maybe that's helpful. Um, regardless, these uh, five months are set by God, and, and uh, they cannot go beyond that. And yet also, <laughs> God's perhaps merciful limitation that they're allowed to torment but not to kill um, is part of the torture as well. Now, verse six is it's a pretty chilling verse. In those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. It makes you think of Job also in chapter three, and one of his first extended 
um, prayers um, or complaints, whatever you want to call it. It's this graphic expression of the anguish cry of, of a soul longing for a death that doesn't come. Um, the Roman poet in the first century wrote, worse than any wound is the wish to die and yet not be able to do so. There's this sense of, of hopelessness and the torture is prolonged. And, and yet even in that, we see God's mercy because God is leaving these tormented people a chance to repent and, and to come to him. Yeah, I mean, that is a, a very chilling verse, as you said, that to think that death would be a relief, and in fact, it isn't, and, and perhaps even points to the fact that for those who, who are fooled by the devil and his deceptions, death really isn't any kind of escape, but only leads to the second death, which again is just a chilling thought. Yeah, yeah it's, you know, these these locusts are the the spawn of hell in in a very literal way i think and their goal is to to bring people um to come with them from whence they came i mean this is this is quite quite literally um their their task um so death is death is no friend uh, to those who want to ally themselves with it yeah, yeah. And so all the more need for us to find our hope in Christ, to receive the seal of God from him on our foreheads, to be marked as his own, and to rejoice in the salvation that he has given. We're going to keep looking at this text from Revelation chapter 9 on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Caleb Adams this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable. A college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran. A college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Wednesday, May 31st. We're studying Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 to 21 with Pastor Caleb Adams. He serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Bend, Oregon. Pastor Adams, prior to the break, we were talking about the fifth trumpet, these demonic locusts. And one thing that I think we've kind of at least danced around, but we haven't maybe as said as explicitly as we could, I think the way that we've been talking about these locusts it sounds a lot like, and in fact, I think I even used this phrase, the devil's lies, that we're talking a lot about false teaching. I know you made a couple of references to identifications with the the Pope, I think, and I think you said Luther identified Arius somewhere. So, I mean, are we when we think about the, these demonic locusts, are we talking about false teachings? Are we talking about something else? What do you think? I think so. I think that's probably the best way to to understand what, what John's trying to tell us here. Um we're going to see, you know, as, as we talk about the description of the locusts, there's a very kind of military sense to their appearance and, and how they go about things. And that will be intensified with the sixth trumpet. But military power um, and military um, domination, bringing about torment or, or death, as we'll have in the sixth trumpet, really isn't in view here. This is This is the symbolism pointing us to a a greater war, a greater battle that is going on um, between powers and principalities that that we cannot see. And I think John helps us maybe to understand that by how he describes these locusts and describes um, you know what is yet to come with the sixth trumpet. There, it's really nothing like um, <laughs> nothing like anything we would be able to imagine ourselves. Um, and yet it plays on very common fears <laughs> that we might have. It's a very stark warning against the devil and and the way that he attacks us um, by by doing everything he can to take us away from the truth of of Christ's sacrifice on the cross of of the resurrection of of his victory over sin and death. So talk a little bit about the appearance of these locusts and their king, as John lists it there in verses nine to eleven. Yeah, it, it's interesting because. Um, 
just when we think that we've been told everything there is to know about these guys, um, John goes into a, a more specific description and then talks again about uh, their tails like scorpions and the, the five months uh, that God has set a limit on, on their power. So um, the description of, of these locusts is similar to how, how Satan and his forces are described elsewhere in Genesis. It says that they wore what looked like crowns of gold. Um, mm. They're not wearing crowns of gold. They're, they're wearing something that looks like it. Um, just like, you know, the number of the beast, 666, is just almost there to the number seven that we see all over um, representing the things of God. Um, these, these locusts are almost royal. They're, they're almost there. They're a very clever counterfeit of the real thing, but they don't have real power. Their power whatever it is, is derived from, from what God gives them. They have faces like human faces, hair, like women's hair, teeth, like lion's teeth. I mean, these, these things seem to be playing on, on common fears. Um, especially at, at that time, uh, the Romans were terrified of the Parthians that, that came from the North by the Euphrates, as we'll see in just a second here. And so, so there's definitely some military imagery, um, and that would be intensified, but it's, it's pointing us to, to Satan and how, um, all of his power looks pretty scary, but uh, but in the end, he's not everything he's cracked up to be. Um, and so, <laughs> the same is true, of course, of the the king of of these locusts. Um, we have these two words: this Hebrew and this Greek word, Abaddon and Apollyon, and they they mean the same thing. They mean destruction or destroyer. Um, I like the Vulgate's translation um, of Apollyon. It's exterminon, like the exterminator, or something like that. Uh, this is a, you know, a figure of great dread, um, and it has connections certainly to, um, you know, to the place of, of the dead. Abaddon is sometimes mentioned in in the Old Testament in parallel with Sheol. Um, some commentators have suggested that this is meant to be understood as the Roman emperor um, Domitian, who was, you know, of course, ruling as John wrote this. Nero before him, Caligula before him. Many of the emperors had compared themselves to the Greek god Apollo, and there's certainly, you know, a connection to the, the Greek word there. Um, but again, this is, this is Satan. This is referring to um, the king of the forces of hell, um, who in the end, of course, <laughs> his revelation is very eager to tell us is no king at all. Um, he's going to, he's going to fall into every trap he lays before others. Uh, Proverbs 15 says, Sheol and Abaddon lie open, before the Lord, um, before Yahweh, it is it is God who is in charge of of all of this, and so uh, so this is significant because uh, we have there um, in verse twelve, you know, kind of an intermission, if you will. The first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come, and, and we jump right into it. Um, it's a reminder that you know there's never going to be a time of complete peace and rest for the church militant until until Jesus comes and makes all things right. Um, but we see God's power in evidence through all of this. So then that takes us into the sixth trumpet, which is blown in verse 13. And John hears a voice that's coming from the horns of the golden altar before God. And that voice tells the sixth angel to release four angels bound at the great river Euphrates. Uh, whose voice might this be? And why the release of these angels bound at the river Euphrates. Yeah. Again, more compelling and uh, difficult questions to answer. Um, I don't know if we can say with certainty whose voice this is. Um, it definitely is coming from God. If it's not God or the lamb himself, you know, we've already had mention in, in the book of revelation about the, the angel of the altar. Uh, we've heard about the saints crying out from beneath the altar. Um, it's possible that it's any one of those or, or all of them put together, or maybe this is, this is God himself. But regardless, once again, we're, we're just seeing this emphasis over and over again, that everything that's happening here is initiated by God, not by Satan, uh, who appears to be in control. And so, um, so God, in one way or another, um, calls out to the sixth angel, who then refers to he then refers to these four angels. So we have seven angels blowing seven trumpets, and then we have four angels within the seven angels. So if you're not confused yet, then uh, there's a lot of luck. angels. <laughs> but <laughs> but so um, 
yeah, the sixth angel is told to release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So uh, let's talk about the Euphrates first, and then, then we can jump into the four, the four angels here. Uh, the Euphrates is, is obviously a very important river throughout human history. It's an important river in the Bible. It's mentioned in Genesis chapter two as, as one of the four rivers at the very beginning. Um, makes me think of, you know, as this decreation intensifies, uh, perhaps <laughs> we're, we're caused or we are led to think of, of God's creation and how everything is, is falling apart. Um, I think a, perhaps an even better uh, reason for John including it here is, is its role both in um, the history of, of Israel and in the Roman Empire of the time. Um, all of the, the big enemies, I guess, apart from Egypt of God's people have always come from the north from the Euphrates, you know, you have the Assyrians coming in and then God sends them back. And then, then he sends the Babylonians. Um, this is just a kind of a repeated thing. And the Romans at the time, as we already said, feared greatly an attack of the Parthians from beyond the Euphrates. And so, um, you know, these historical enemies and threats seem to be connected to um, eschatological enemies of God's people. Um, this is this is not good news um, that this force is about to be unleashed from the Euphrates, and it's unleashed unleashed by the four angels. We have the definite article here. So, so who are these angels? It would suggest um, you know that there is a definitive group of some kind because we have the article here. Is it the same as the four angels back in chapter seven? Uh, perhaps some commentators would say absolutely it is, and others would say no, clearly it's not. Um, are these four angels holy angels or are they demonic angels? You know, opinion is is split on that too. Um, Lou Brighton, who I was privileged to take a class on Revelation from, he writes in his commentary, these four angels are a definite group of holy angels acting under God's will. Because he would suggest that whenever the word angels used in Revelation, it refers to a holy angel unless we're explicitly told otherwise. Um, but regardless... Um, these angels, whoever they are, <laughs> um, have been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year, um, which, again, is just showing us that God has a, a very specific plan, an exact timetable that he's established for for the unveiling of, of all of these events. Um, and and this, one's, this one's a pretty big event as uh, a third of mankind is allowed to, to be killed. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the connection to the holy angels it seems fitting in this case because of the way that these angels have been prepared for this precise moment, and the while I I'm not sure <laughs> if the if the identification of these four angels the four angels that are holding back the four winds in Revelation seven if they're the same ones there does seem to be at least a similar purpose there. All of it, again, pointing to the fact that you keep emphasizing, and I think it's so helpful, that this is not outside of God's control. This is a part of His direction, part of His judgment, and that does bring us comfort as Christians, even as we're watching these just fantastic description of, of what's happening. So we had demonic locusts in the previous one, and we're going to see a similar, just a, a wild vision here again. But before you actually get the description of, of what this looks like, there's a number here that's remarkable, especially for, for the time. So in verse 16, we're going to see an, an army here. There's mounted troops, and it's twice 10,000 times 10,000. John, here's that number. I mean, we talked about the importance of numbers in, in the book of Revelation. What's this one, and what does it mean? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And um, it reminds me when Peter comes to Jesus and says, Lord, how often must I forgive my brother? Seven times, right? That That's that's a big number, Lord, seven times. And Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. And the mathematicians among us, you know, start a checklist of 490. And at 491, you know, we can withhold forgiveness. Well, of course, that's not what Jesus means. This is an expression of the, the unlimited forgiveness of God that we are to share with our brothers and sisters. And I think the same thing's happening here. We have just this almost impossible to conceive um, number. If you do the math, it's 200 million mounted troops. And, and some people have taken the time to figure out exactly what this would look like. Um, that if this was a cavalry in, in the real world that was one mile wide, 
it would be 85 miles long. Um, wow. And so perhaps there's a reason John says, I heard their number instead of I was able to, to conceive it all of, of what it actually was. But um, yeah, um, BDAG says that of this uh, phrase in Revelation 9, this is an indefinite number of incalculable immensity, uh, which if taken literally would be 200 million. Um, right. Gordon Feast commentary says, that 200 million was a number that in antiquity simply did not exist. As far as anyone can tell, it was larger than the population of the entire world at this time. Um, and so the, the clear indication seems to be um, this is, a, this is a, a force of which we cannot even begin to conceive of, of its size and of its power, this demonic army. Uh, like the locus of the previous plague is now even a step up, you know, from trumpet number five. Uh, we're in we're in big trouble here. Is that this is the last battle? Okay, so we we've got this huge demonic army, inconceivable in terms of its its number, and then John starts to describe what he does see on these with these horses and those riding them. Talk about the description of this of this just immense army. Yeah, so these are these are mounted troops. You know, this is a, a cavalry, horses um, with their riders on them. But John seems to to play a little fast and loose with with exactly what this looks like. Is he describing the horses? Is he describing the riders? He really seems to mesh the two together. Um, that the horses and riders are really regarded as one figure. A um, couple of figures in the the early church. Um, pointed out and I, and I tend to agree with them that the horses are are men being ridden by evil spirits or by demons uh, having submitted to them and, and being ruled by them um you know luther with his uh fifth trumpet identification of arius um, would kind of take the next step historically speaking and he would suggest that the second woe is is the infamous mohammed and his companions um, who with doctrines and with the sword laid great plagues upon Christendom. Uh, but again, I, I would say that, that Luther's got part of, part of the story. You know, this is everything, everything Satan has to throw at the Lord. And so we have, you know, these, these horses and their riders and they're described uh, just like the locusts were, uh, we're given some details here. They have breastplates, the color of fire and sapphire and sulfur, this, this fiery red and dark blue and, and yellow, which seem to correspond to the fire and the smoke and the sulfur that, that's going to be mentioned um, just after, um, seems to be certainly pointing us forward to the, the lake of sulfur um, that is going to be the, the final destination of, of these forces of Satan. Um, we have heads like lions again, which you know it calls to mind some of the New Testament imagery of, of Satan. Satan is like a roaring lion. Again, he's not the lion. Yahweh is the lion, but he's like a roaring lion waiting for someone to devour. Um, we have fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of these, these horses. You know, we had locusts like scorpions, and now we have, we have horses like a dragon. Again, anticipating what we're going to hear about Satan coming up. Um, and, you know, we had these locusts with these powerful tails. Well, here we have um, horses. And John says the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. Reminded me of, of that phrase my kids love to hear when we do a coin toss. Heads I win, tails you lose. Um, <laughs> that's what's happening here. I mean, you, either way, <laughs> you're, in, you're in big trouble. Uh, Satan uses his mouth to deceive. Um, and, and the tails of these horses are, are like a serpent. And so we have this, this just terrifying, terrifying force coming after the world. Um, but it also called to mind for me is, you know, we see all these plagues in, in Egypt. Well, what, what was the end of all of that? Um, the end of it was Israel found themselves on the other side of the Red Sea, uh, singing out loud, I will sing to Yahweh, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider. He is thrown into the sea. And so God is showing us this vision of, of this, this final last battle. Um, but we know who wins. We know who, yeah. who is victorious. 
Yeah, I mean, just with the picture of the military here, I, I'm reminded of the the way that the Lord often identifies Himself in the Old Testament that He is the Yahweh Sabaoth. So the the Lord of Hosts is how this often gets translated. That He's the Lord of Armies, and that includes the enemy armies. He is He is certainly the commander of His own army, the angelic armies, His own people. But He actually has control over the enemy armies as well. And so no matter no matter how powerful they seem. You know, as the people of Israel saying on the other side of the sea, the horse and the rider get thrown into the sea, that the no enemy army is outside of the Lord's control. And that's true of even these demonic armies, the locusts, the, the soldiers that are pictured here in the fifth and sixth trumpets, the Lord still remains the Lord of the armies. And as we'll see in the rest of the book of Revelation, the victory is his, even when it may not look like it, he is protecting his people. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, this is... This is why Revelation 9, which if I'm honest, when I saw this was what we were going to be talking about, was probably probably the last chapter of Revelation that I was excited <laughs> about talking about. But even in even in this chapter, as you said, we see we see Jesus because we know that that he is in control of all of this and, and that ultimately um, victory belongs to him and to all who have been sealed into him who have been been washed clean by his blood. Now after the these two trumpets have been blown, verses 20 and 21 of this chapter describe the reaction, and it's it's not what the Lord was aiming for. We've talked about the connection to the Exodus, and the Lord's intent in sending the plagues was to let the Egyptians know that he is the Lord, that they would repent and believe. And here we see a reaction very similar to Pharaoh's. So what what do we see? What's the reaction of, of most of mankind who's not killed here by these by these plagues? Yeah, the rest of mankind did not repent. Um, and there's a, a repetition in verses 20 and in 21 of this phrase, did not repent. Uh, they did not repent of the works of their hands, you know, a reference typically to, to the making of idols, uh, nor giving up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. You know, we hear echoes of, of the Old Testament here, um, Isaiah's, you know, extended um, attack on idolatry and the foolishness of it, how, how those who worship idols become like them. Um, yeah, the, the goal of, of all of this was to turn the people from their idols, and instead they, they doubled down, uh, like Pharaoh hardening his heart over and over and over again. Uh, Paul Kretzman in his popular commentary on, on the, the scriptures says, truly, this is a description of the abyss of human depravity, which is... Uh, Good work by Kretzman bringing in the abyss from the beginning of the chapter to the end. We really, we really see that to be the case. Um, it, it's also though here in chapter nine, um, you know, the indication here that they did not repent uh, shows us that that what we've read is terrifying as they are, um, are not to be understood as God's final judgment. That, that God's final judgment is is still on the way, and um, it's also. Um, again, both a, a comfort and, and perhaps a sorrow for us. We should not expect that, that we're going to have this mass conversion of, of the entire earth you know, at the end time. The Bible just doesn't speak that way. Most people are, are always going to resist God's call to repentance. And, and the people here in Revelation 9 um, really are continuing to sin against God in, in both tables of the law. Uh, John, as, as Paul does in 1 Corinthians, when he says that what pagans sacrifice um, to idols they offer to demons. Um, John here identifies false gods with, with worshiping demons. And the irony, of course, is that these very demons are the ones that are, that are tormenting them. Um, these idols are, are worthless, blind, and, and deaf, and lame. Um, but they're not only breaking the, the first commandment in the first table of the law, they're they're continuing on with their their murders and their sorceries, their sexual immorality, and their theft. You know, we're I think supposed to understand here that that these people are still continuing to break God's law in in every possible way. Um, and this is, as you said, not not what God was aiming for. Um, but it builds up some suspense for us as we wait until chapter eleven and the blowing of the seventh trumpet. 
Yeah, yeah, that is that is still to come. We we heard that the first woe has passed. There's two still to come. We've heard the beginning of that second woe in this chapter. The next phrase about the second woe passing is coming later in chapter eleven. So more to to hear and to learn from the book of Revelation. We've got about four minutes here, Pastor Adams, reflecting on this very strange chapter of scripture, one that is doesn't show up in the lectionary, one that you read and you're like, whoa, what am I supposed to picture here? What what do we take from this chapter? What's the what's the warning? What's the hope for us as Christians? Yeah, I, I guess I think you know what we're supposed to take from Revelation nine could be said of of the book as a whole as well. Um, and the first one is just a, a note of caution as we try to read this book and interpret it. Uh, we need to always be very careful to be judicious in how we do that. Um, you know, Revelation as a whole, but especially these middle chapters. Um, maybe chapter nine in particular, just, you know, rife for misinterpretation, misapplication. Uh, It was interesting. I I happened upon a few, um, a few notes of how, you know, contemporary um, bloggers and and readers have um, kind of interpreted these chapters and, and the events in there. For example, the great mountain that's thrown burning into the sea in chapter eight uh, was apparently the deep water horizon oil rig um world war tank world war one tank warfare was uh, seen as a fulfillment of um you know the the sixth trumpet in revelation nine and so i think one lesson of of chapter nine of revelation is just be careful to to draw any um, parallels that that may or may not um have any accuracy whatsoever and and attend to what god is really interested in teaching us just as the main lesson of revelation back in its time of writing was not primarily about Domitian and the Roman Empire. Uh, the main message of Revelation for us is is to look to Christ. Um, and so we have we have both law and gospel, you know, in, in Revelation. Uh, Revelation 9 is pretty law heavy in many ways, um, though we certainly saw gospel there. Uh, but we have all these these highly symbolic plagues, but the fact that they're symbolic does not mean that they're not real they're intensely real and repentance and faith are, are the only remedy, the only escape from their power. And so uh, we should learn from those just as we learn from, from Pharaoh in, in Exodus, we should learn from the impenitence of the people in chapter nine um, to drive toward a, a deeper repentance and faith. And then finally, I, I think the lesson is comfort and hope are, are to be found in one place. They're to be found in, in God's promises in Revelation, they're they're to be found in in the Lamb in His blood in the the purity that we have through Him. Um, they're to be found in in the victory of, of Yahweh in the Lamb over death and and over sin. Um, we should be reminded, even by what we read today, that we have been purified and washed and and protected from the assaults of the enemy for for all of eternity, and that should lead us to to rejoice and to celebrate, even in Revelation chapter nine. That's right. That's right. We have been sealed by the Lord himself. We bear that seal on our foreheads. He protects us by the blood of Christ that has marked us as his own. Pastor Caleb Adams is pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in Bend, Oregon. He has been helping us today to study Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 to 21. Pastor Adams, thanks for being our guest today. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about Revelation chapter 9, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. You can also use the open mic feature on the app to send a message to us. Either way, it is always a pleasure to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.